So it's my pleasure to uh, have Jennifer join us today to share stories of social entrepreneurship from the front lines. I actually met Jen when I was doing my own PhD research interviewing social entrepreneurs. So she was at the very early nascent stages of her social enterprise adventures. Um, so we'll have a chance for Q&A in a little bit. So um, thanks all of you for being here. Sorry my back is to see you guys. So Jen. Take us back to before Artistry sued. What were you doing and what were you thinking about and what was going on in your life? Um, well, I, 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 had, uh, I had actually a pretty sweet life by the standards of all the people I knew and by what I could have imagined as a graduate student in history, which as some of you may know is not a really employable field. <laughs> um, and I... Um, you know, I had been—I had taught for many years. I had been a teacher and a curriculum develop, developer, and I made a move into public history. So it happened that you know I, I reached a point in my life when I was working for uh, the government in public history. So I was working—I worked for the Museum of Civilization, and then I worked for uh, National Historic Sites. Um, and and during that period of time, I found myself uh, for the first time in a on a trip in the developing world. So this is going back about maybe ten or twelve years ago, and I was—I um, was just like shocked by what I saw, shocked and moved and touched and, you know, I mean, if people have kind of traveled, they get, you get a, I traveled very widely, but not in, in conditions like in, in some places in India where there's, um, you know, some really like some, such, some deep beauty, but also some like tragedy. And I was kind of aware of the fact that I wasn't actually doing anything. For the first time I realized that there was some stuff going on in the world that I hadn't, you know, you can read newspapers and stuff, but you don't really notice until you're, I don't know, or at least I didn't notice until I was like facing it and I just felt like I'm not, I'm not actually doing anything to make this better somehow, you know, and I was kind of aware that I'd had a lot of opportunities and, well, I mean, for, good fortune that other people just didn't have and it just sort of led to a phase of feeling really uncomfortable with what I was doing and or not doing, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, um, you know, I spent some time kind of getting really disgruntled with my work, feeling that it was totally useless and I wasn't doing anything useful. And I mean, I had a great job. Don't get me wrong, I had a great job, with great salary, great income, great benefits. Did I mention I worked for the government? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, but I just really like, I, I was kind of conscious of this sort of increasing dissatisfaction. And so I started doing, I started doing some research into what, what could, what could, what could I do? Like what I could do with my kind of interests and skill sets and, and passions and what could I do that would actually make a difference. So I know that you studied women's history mm -hmm. and in particular how, um, maybe I'll let you speak to it, sort of. The, the issue that women's artisanal work is not as valued as men's historically. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could say a few words about that. Yeah, well, that, I mean, I was, I, what I actually, what I studied, you know, and kind of a very theoretical, the very theoretical framework, which is a PhD in history, is um, how change happens. Like, what I was really looking at was the, I, our, our, how ideas about women's role change quickly. And as I started working in public history and working with material culture, like working with stuff and things that women do and things that you know women make and use, um, as a as a public historian trying to collect things for national collections, I kind of realized that we didn't actually have any objects, you know, to, to tell women's stories, and that we didn't really value them. Um, I mean, even women themselves, like women would would call and say, "Oh, you know, my husband just died, and I've got some stuff, you know, some boots and a satchel. Do you want them?" be like, I don't know how was a boot, you know, it's, it's like a process of trying to get people to understand that just the, the kind of the, the stuff of the men in their lives is not just by default more important because they had a paying job around it, you know, and so, um, yeah, so I was really driven also to, 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 to kind of, you know, uh, to create a context in which women's work could be valued and and that was really important to me. And especially important because what women do is a lot of stuff that you don't really notice. Like women have made textiles, for example, for 20,000 years and you don't think about, maybe it doesn't seem that important that you're all wearing clothes, for example, but it's really actually pretty critical. And um, so there's, you know, there's that whole idea that what the stuff that women make and do is not really being valued. And, and also that a lot of really like fine work, like really 
you know, kind of accomplished techniques are being lost because we don't we don't support them in the world or we don't care about them. We're not really interested in them and stuff like that. So you had that knowledge in the background and mm -hmm. wanting to do more. Mm -hmm. So was there an aha moment? <laughs> well, the aha moment really came. The, I mean, there were a couple of aha moments, but they didn't really culminate neatly into a, into a solution. You know, um, I, the aha moment was, oh my God, there's stuff in the world that I am not contributing to. And a, a second aha moment came when I visited like a tiny little school in India that my friend's dad had founded with like three hundred dollars. I suddenly had the a kind of realization that I could actually that one person could do something. You know, that you could do a person could actually make a difference. Maybe it's like a difference in 15 people's lives this year and 15 more next year. But that that makes a difference, you know? For those 15 people, that's a huge difference. And so that was a really big deal for me. And it kind of started me thinking about what I could bring. And as I say, like I, I ended up going back to India and looking at, um, at kind of what, I had, I had an idea that, you know, like if we could kind of sell that stuff and raise value around it, around the things that women were making and creating and really like, you know, the, th the textiles they were making and the techniques they knew, I, I thought that, that could be like a really good solution. And I went back to India and I did actually kind of a, an environmental scan. I did a, like sort of a study of what groups are doing on the ground there and I saw that some really interesting stuff was working around, you know, women creating things and having it you know, trying to find a market for it and kind of supporting them that way, like finding actual markets for the stuff that they were making. So I thought that that would be like a great idea and with a ba kind of a background in museums and sort of an understanding of material culture that I could try to, you know, like create some value around that. So then what? So, so then, um, so, then <laughs> so then with absolutely zero background in retail, I decided to open a store. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Okay, don't try this at home. <laughs> At least get a job at the Gap folding clothes or something. You know? <laughs> um, I barely even liked shopping, so I, 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 it really was like totally not a smart thing. Um, <laughs> so, but I had I had just kind of done a lot of research, and I thought, okay, this could work, you know. And there's like the, you know, there were some trends around maybe consumer awareness and an interest in fair trade, and I thought, oh yeah, this is a great idea. So I opened a store here in Montreal, um, and believe it was a steep learning curve. I joke that that was my my. MBA, that my the, the money I sank into that enterprise was my <laughs> was my uh, business school education. Um, I don't have a business school education either, as you'll recall from the intro. So yeah, I, I opened a store, and it was it was actually I mean it was it was it was great, and it was a super good learning experience for me. And I, I, I interfaced so much with the public, and I got a really good sense. I, I built a lot of skills around what people are looking for, what people are interested in, what touches people, and and also working with the women, like what they what they need to know to be able to actually kind of work in the marketplace, you know. So, so then you pivoted. Uh huh. So yes. You, the store. Mm -hmm met its moment of ending. Right, yeah. And then? <laughs> well, some stuff happened, which I'll just skip over. I can tell you later if you want to hear all the details, all the gory details. Um, but some stuff happened and I, well actually what happened, what, one of the things that happened was about a year into the store I realized, so I had this store, right, and I realized that uh, what I thought was I was going to sell all the stuff and like the proceeds were going to go into training women. Uh, to help them develop their capacity to actually meet the needs of the market, you know, create more income for themselves. Except I, I kind of realized after about a year that there were actually going to be no proceeds, at least not for the foreseeable future. So um, I then had to figure out what I was going to do because there were barely enough proceeds to keep me and my dog alive. So I thought, okay, this is not going to be the solution. And I launched a nonprofit organization. I, I, I mean, I met some. You know, I had met, of course, in the course of opening the store, I met a lot of people. It turned out there's a lot, a whole community of people who are really interested in that stuff. So I met some people, including the former director of Fair Trade in Latin America, and we like we felt that it would be a great idea to open a nonprofit, and in that way we could kind of marshal some other resources specifically dedicated to the training. So the 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 nonprofit organization I launched, Artist Resuit, actually, you know, shortly after I had opened the store, and eventually, I closed the store because for various reasons that wasn't doing the job that I had hoped that it would do. Um, and I decided to focus full time on, on the NGO. So yeah, I spent the next kind of two years, um, you know, assembling committees of people and developing a curriculum and um, raising money. Yeah. 
So what, what, what the early stages of this um, artistry 2.0, yeah. uh, what did that look like? What were you trying to achieve? Well, by, I, by the time Artistry 2.0 was launched, it sounds so, it sounds so you know, well thought out when you put it like that, doesn't it? <laughs> so I planned it that way. Um, I realized that I was going to you know, have to kind of take a different tack to actually help women develop the skills that they needed to create more income for themselves. So I, yeah, so I, I mean, I kind of assembled, a, I, I got some, you know, I had already come in contact with lots of people who were really interested, so I sort of assembled a team of people, a team of people trying to work on a curriculum, some, you know, educational consultants and things like that, so we developed a curriculum that was kind of based on my, by then, five years of experience of working with artisans and seeing what they needed and, you know, to be able to just, you know, sell things and develop skills. Um, we had to raise money because we had no money to, it was great, it was a great idea, but we had no money to implement it. So <coughs> I had to, uh, you know, we kind of looked for people that could help us figure out how to raise some money, so we, we did events, like, which is not a way to raise money, by the way, just like if you're anyone who's taking notes, don't, <laughs> don't try to raise money with events, it's a nightmare. Um, but anyway, after a couple of years, we managed to raise enough money to implement the program. Um, but yeah, those first years were really, actually really difficult and, discouraging years because it's not that easy if you, if, if you just I mean it's like anything if you have a good idea it's like great come back to us when you've actually tested your good idea <coughs> and, and we can see that it's not just a good idea so it's a lot of it's a lot of work getting the good idea to actually be more than a good idea so just to reflect back this version of artistry was you were offering entrepreneurship training to mm -hmm. women in different parts of the world to allow the the crafts that they were already making to enter the market for a revenue stream. Am I getting that? That's right. Yes, exactly. Okay. So you tell a great story <coughs> about a very touching story about your trip to Bolivia last year when you did this pilot training mm. module. So walk okay. us through that. Right. So last year, we, I mean, we, after the, all the difficult stuff, we, we finally uh, were able to implement this project in Bolivia for various reasons we cho chose Bolivia. Uh, we had some partners there, and we so we implemented this training program. And the goal of the training program is exactly to help the women be able to sell their products better. So create better products that people will want to buy, and then figure out how to sell them better, right? So that they can increase their income. So we have a, like an intensive five-day training program, and we went in. And the, and and the objective, like the main objective, is that they can increase their sales. But obviously, there's a lot of really important kind of leadership goals around that, you know, that we want the women to feel like they can actually have an impact on their lives. I mean, that's the thing you need to feel, in fact, to be able to implement a lot of changes in your life. You have to feel like you can actually make a difference in your own life. And so um, we went down and we, you know, we had a, an intensive five-day training program and we delivered the, the, you know, we went in for the training. And on, on the first day, it was kind of an icebreaker exercise and we, we asked the women, you know, kind of like, who are you in your lives? What, what do you, what's your role? Like, what do you, what do you do? You know, and we had, you know, anyway, we had like a, a kind of a setup on the wall and they had to identify who they were and they sort of identified themselves and, you know, really nuts and bolts things. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a weaver, <coughs> I'm a knitter, you know, really kind of nuts and bolts sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, then we went through the training and I saw some really, you know, really moving stuff. Like people really kind of come out of their shell. Like some of these women are really super rural and some of them are kind of edgy, raw, urban women. It was like a really, a, a, a sort of a, a tense mix of people. And at the end of the week, you know, this kind of really intensive training, nine in the morning till nine at night, day and night there, they stayed on site. They lived, you know, they were there at night, everything. We, we repeated the same exercise and we asked them, okay, so who are you? Like in your, you know, like who are you? What roles do you play in your life? And of course, you know, they said the same thing. They were mothers, weavers, but like amazingly, they were also now saying they were leaders, they were change makers, they were community leaders, they were business women. It was just like, it was amazing to me how in the course of just five days they had totally shifted and really completely like opened up what they thought they could be in the world, you know? So, um, yeah, social entrepreneurs often say that the visit on the ground reignites like a full measure of inspiration 
uh, and they go back home excited, inspired. So you've come back from Bolivia, and then what? <laughs> I'm still in the then what. Um, I just came back from Bolivia, so we, we implemented the program last year. And then we had a year of coaching, so we like call them and they have some homework and stuff. And like, you know, lots of people, they don't do the homework, and, <laughs> you know. And so there were some, you know, ups and downs and discouraging moments and some moments where we were scratching our heads thinking, what are we, like, what, <laughs> what happened? Why are, what, why is this happening? So we just went down, yeah, like to do kind of an evaluation and to get, to, to go meet them on the ground and to interview them and say, okay, like what, you know, what's different? What's changed for you? You know, we're really looking at, okay, what, what impact did we have this fat training in this whole last year? And it was exactly super energizing because, um, I mean, I don't even know where to start, but, but people, I mean, basically the worst case scenario that we heard was that the, the worst thing was that women, oh, there, was, there was a couple of women who incre experienced an increase, a 40% increase in the sales that they had over last year. That's the worst. And the best was over double. And all kinds of, like it was like, yeah, it's crazy. Just crazy, insane results. And yeah, I mean, it's so, so exciting. It's so fun because they're, they, they just like, and we had people saying, you know, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like as soon as we went into the interview, they were like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. I know I didn't do the year's worth of homework. I know I'm really sorry. I didn't have time. I had so much business. <laughs> <laughs> just implementing like half the, the stuff you told us in the training. Uh, I just didn't have time to do all the homework. I was like, we'll work around that. <laughs> we'll work around your increase in sales. Um, yeah, like one one woman was able to take out a loan, to get out of. They have kind of a weird tenancy arrangement, you know. Some some anyway. Uh, and I, one woman was able to like actually get a loan with her increase in sales. She was able to get a loan to start building a house of her own for her family. Um, one woman belonged to an organization, like a little association. They have little like associations of artisans. That in this particular one, we were dealing with a few groups, but one of them. Uh, they had a little store, like one of the groups had a little store, and she became a store manager. You know, she was one of the people that in the training had really kind of emerged as sort of, you know, like she really kind of bloomed, you know. She sort of emerged as somebody who became kind of talkative and sort of ended up sort of taking a stand for things. And, and she was store manager when we went down there, and it was one woman had so much business that she had to hire somebody, so it was like creating employment. Um, yeah, and it was like between 40 and 110% increase in sales. And that's like, for, for, for some people, like for the 60 to 110%, that's like, that's from below the poverty line to above the poverty line. That's in a year. It's like, yeah, we were blown away. So. So now I've known you for many years, mm -hmm. and it hasn't always been smiles. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I know that when we invited you to share some of your learning and pivoting and iteration um, to the MOOC group, uh -huh. um, you, you almost came slightly reluctantly and maybe as a favor to me because you were busy preparing for that trip. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your headspace going in and sort of what you left with, because mm -hmm. it's worth maybe sharing as a social entrepreneur what the experience is like that's not always glamorous or happy or successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I wish I could say that it was, but it mostly isn't. Um, it's a lot of like grueling work when you spend a lot of time wondering, what was I thinking? And really, I mean, this very this very last six months was like a really hard, actually, six months because we had this I, we had this training program. Like, the, the, there was the training, and then there was this coaching for a year. And the idea was that we the idea was that we kind of create little like pairs, so they're like working to support each other, and then periodically, they're, one of the members of the pairs is reporting back to us. So we're kind of coaching them. So the idea is that they develop a, a reliance on each other rather than us, but at the same time that we provide a kind of support to help integrate the stuff that they learned like last September. And they were really happy because one of the things that came out of our needs assessment process was that, you know, it's great that we learn a lot, of, we learn some stuff in a training, but then we never, we don't know how to implement it actually. You know, we learn it, but then we, it's like, great, they're so energized when you come out of a training. I'm sure anyone who's been, been in a kind of an intensive workshop knows this. But then sometimes like putting it into your actual life is not so easy. 
So we thought, well, this is like a perfect solution. But the last six months of it was really a struggle. Like people wouldn't answer the phone, and people weren't doing submitting the things that they were, you know, that they had that they had identified. Like we we worked on a a plan for them that was based on their strategic objectives for the year. You know, like this time of year we need to kind of develop a new product for a, a, a fair that we're going to. So we were like, okay, well that's a good homework assignment. You know, how about if you develop your new collection for this time? Like we, we did it all with them. It wasn't anything that was imposed or anything. But still, it was like such a struggle and they didn't answer the phone and we, we couldn't reach them and they weren't submitting the assignments and we were like, what, what did, where did we go wrong? You know, like, and it's really hard because if people don't talk to you, you can't begin to figure out, you know, like it's like, okay, we, we know that we've got to make some adjustments. Look, it's a pilot, we know, but it's hard, it's really hard, and you try to imagine, but I was feeling really like distant from them, and I realized now that I had I was taking it really personally, and I was like, you know, if, if stuff is really brutal, you just kind of start to disengage, you know, and that's how I felt going into that, um, that workshop, which was like only three short weeks ago or something. Um, I felt really just, you know, just kind of disengaged, like I'm going into this with my brain, we need to do an evaluation, we need to see how things are, but I was really not, you know, I was just feeling like, oh, we kind of, I don't know, somehow this got away from us, you know? Uh, and, and when I went into the, the, the workshop, one of the, th one of the themes of the workshop was really like this iterative process, and I mean, there were a couple of, you know, big corporate examples that were given, like how long it took them to get to a model that was sustainable and workable and like some big major, you know, corporations that are names that everybody would know, like it took them, you know, 15 years to get to work with the model. And I was thinking, I came out and I was like, okay, 15 years, we got like another seven years to <laughs> screw this up, you know? <laughs> so I felt a lot like, okay, well, yeah, I should, you know, you, sometimes it's just like hard to be feeling like you're failing all the time. And that's how it was feeling like for the last like six months, you know? And then when I, kind of working in a room and listening to other people's stories and listening to other people's experiences, I started to feel like, oh yeah, okay, all right. I forgot that feeling as part of, you know, getting somewhere. It's like, so I felt pretty, pretty good coming out of that. I felt kind of energized. And so now what? How do you imagine it going forward and scaling? Well, uh... <laughs> <laughs> We, <laughs> does it seem like I have this all figured out? Um, well, I think, it, you know, now I really like, it's really clear to me that we have something. We definitely have something. And I think we have something that we can sell now, you know? And I, it's really, what's really clear too is that it's, it's much easier to sell. It, this seems really obvious, like I should have known this, but now that I've come back with really good results, it's obvious that that's gonna be helpful in selling it, you know? I mean, of course, I, you could know that kind of intellectually, but now that I'm coming back, it's like, it's totally gonna be easy to sell now, you know? <laughs> Nothing is easy, by the way. I know, I want you to, don't come back to me in eight months and say, so was it easy? It's not gonna be easy, it's not easy. But um, I really feel like, you know, we, we got some seed funding actually from a uh, foundation in the US to roll out this project in Chile. Uh, we had some, we had some like really uh, kind of motivated and engaged interest from a group of Mapuche uh, women in Chile. So, and we've got some, we've we've got actually a grant, not a, not a grant to roll out the whole project. But I really think that with like great results and 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 some, you know, get kind of growing institutional support that we can we can start to actually scale this and implement it. I think basically, like these are. The stuff that we're teaching is not, you know, super amazing, new, crazy things. It's just like based on really concrete things that I learned over the five years of dealing with them that they kind of need to know and they don't know. And I think the fact that we had such great results with a five-day training program really shows that there's, there, there's, there's like easy stuff that they can implement to make, make big changes, you know? And I, I, think it's, I think it's scalable. I think it's... I think with not a lot of adjusting, it can be rolled out in a lot of places. So now it's just now it's just to get, get, get our ducks lined up and do it. So before I pass it on to the class, um, I would ask maybe if you have any words of advice for budding social entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> 
That's not what you meant, eh? No. <laughs> um, I think you have to, you know, look, I don't know. Uh, you have to do what moves you. You know, you have to do what like speaks to you. Sometimes people ask me like, why, why you do this? There's all these other people here that need help, and these people, and these people, and it's like, I think, I don't know. I, I, I went in the direction that that spoke to me, where I felt like I could bring something that could make a difference. Like, not everyone can do everything. Not everything touches everybody. Like, everybody has a role to play. I think, I think that's one of the most discouraging things. You know, that sometimes you feel like, okay, what can I do that isn't already being done? And I think the answer is lots. You know, you can do lots that isn't being done. So, do it. 